Hello. Well, welcome to the uh, podcast for Multi-Faith Matters. My name is John Moorhead. I'm the director of this Motley crew. And uh, today in the podcast, my guest is uh, Phil Wyman. Uh, Phil is also a part of the Phil, uh, Multi-Faith Matters. Uh, it started as a grant team. It has now become something else to resource and promote and network uh, churches and others interested in reaching out to people in other religious traditions in uh, Christ-like and loving and hospitable ways. Uh, I first met uh, Phil years ago when he was uh, only, in quotes, uh, pastor oh, of uh, yeah. the Gathering Church in Salem, Massachusetts. Uh, I became aware of his uh, amazing, crazy work with uh, pagans, uh, particularly this huge outreach around Halloween time in Salem. I had the uh, opportunity to go out years ago and see that, and it was just amazing. But uh, Phil is doing many more things, and I'm going to turn it over to Phil now to kind of introduce himself and, and talk about his background and what he's doing. Hey. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's, Welcome, Phil. This, this, has been a, this has been a long, wild ride, huh? It has. <laughs> so I, uh, I started traveling full-time two years ago. I pastored in Salem for since 1999, and, and we had this outreach that occurred during our month-long Halloween you know, where a million people flow into Salem, and and I looked at it as an opportunity to touch the world. Um, but that also became something that we began to look at as a model for perhaps touching other festivals and destination locations. So I've been traveling full time doing that, and I. I not so jokingly tell people I'm looking for a million people to go into festivals, to go to destination locations and to um, create some kind of outreach um, to, to reach people. Um, Cause I look at those places as places where people come seeking, right? That's what people do. They come to Salem, whether they're looking for a, a palm reading or, a, you know, their tarot cards read, they're seeking something. And they just happen to bump into us, <laughs> which is a bit of a surprise. So, so that's what I'm doing right now. And right now, I'm 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 in uh, Oceanside, California. I used to pastor in Carlsbad, and so I was at the church this last Sunday, um, kind of spreading my news about, hey, come follow me to weird places. <clears throat> so that yeah, that's what I'm doing now. I just I just came back from Slab City, which is. Uh, a place where nomads and travelers can boondock, travel, and camp for free. Um, and Slab City is a weird place. <coughs> Excuse me. Kind of a weird place where people with their half a million dollar motor homes and their and and tweakers, who you know are meth head tweakers, are all living together in this big weird place in the middle of the desert, and can do so for free. Um, so that that was a bit of an interesting experience as well. So I, I there, there's in what I'm doing, it's a little bit of trying to follow some of the subcultures that people are typically afraid of or don't have any contact with, as well as going to places where people are predominantly going there because they're looking for something in life. Um, so that's become a full-time thing, and I spend part of the year in the UK, part of the year traveling around in Priscilla, the motorhome, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, and part of the year taking care of my mom right now is uh, not doing so well. She's in Long Beach, California. So okay, well let's we're going to unpack this as we go through the interview here. Let, let's start with the first part of it. Uh, well, you initially had uh, been doing work with pagans. I don't want to assume that uh, those watching this conversation understand what that's all about. How would you define that, and what would be some examples of, of pagans and paganism? Yeah, it, boy, it's it's pretty frustrating as somebody who's dealt with a group of people who identify themselves religiously. That's their spiritual moniker, as it were, uh, paganism, uh, witchcraft, or druidism. I mean, there's a, a number of names to hear the word pagan or the word heathen which is another religious moniker that's part of paganism to hear those words used in most christian settings they're just generic terminology about somebody who has no interest in god and maybe not even in spiritual things that's that's a predominant 
generic definition we get from pulpits. But paganism today is an actual religious identification. And it's, it's, it's a big umbrella term, paganism. Um, and anthropologically, we might think of it as neo-paganism because we don't know what the ancient pagans really practiced in their, their spiritual pursuits. We might know the names of some of their gods. We might know the stories of their myths that come from Rome and Greece and Ireland and Wales and Norway, Egypt, but we don't know their practices. So starting around the middle part of the 20th century, there was a revival in an attempt to uh, rediscover these practices. And a lot of it was made up, and so we call it neo-paganism. And so people who call themselves witches or druids or neo-shamans, um, there, there's groups of heathen, um, there, and there's all kinds of subcategories of witches. These are practitioners typically of, uh, of magic. They want to somehow, typically they want to benefit the world in a positive way by doing spell casting, um, witches do. And they have something they call, um, uh, uh, oh, my mind just went blank here, <laughs> the terminology, uh, corresponding elements. Mm -hmm. And so they take, they take smells and bells and colors and, and times of the year and whatnot, and with the force of will, they create a spell and they, they ask for peace or, um, you know, for love life to be improved or finances or it might be something like that. But not even all pagans are practicing magic. Some of them just follow those old myths and believe that they inform their lives in a positive way, you know, the myths of, of Nordic gods and whatnot. And they typically are very have a green spirituality. That's another thing that that, that marks um, a pagan. And so they care for the earth. And they typically um, are desiring very good things. And we have this picture of a dark witch or um, a, a pagan who wants to somehow infiltrate the church and do dark things. You know, that's been a that's been a standard uh, belief of. Um, Christians about this category of people for so long, and that's not what I've discovered. And I literally have met thousands of witches and druids, and I know them from from all of them who live in Salem, which is about somewhere between five and ten percent of the population of Salem, uh, which is like five hundred to a thousand times more likely for you and I to meet a witch <laughs> in Salem than anywhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. You know. Maybe some of the other unique places like Glastonbury, England. But I know pagans in the UK. I know pagans all across the US. And of course, there's some people who might be a little scary, but I find that in the Christian church <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> you know, every religion has its, right. its dark little side, right? Um, but for, you know, I, I wrote a book about this. Um, it, was, it was actually a study I was doing at, at Fuller at the time. Uh, an anthropology of American neo-paganism, and it's called Witches Are Real People Too. And that's the thing we just need to remember about all these, all the religious groups, all the subcultures, the th th people we might be afraid of, they're just real people. Um, and, and so, yeah, neo-pagan is all of those things I've just defined. It could be a witch or a shaman or um, a druid. Um, yeah. And a heathen, that's another term that's used. And there are normal people who have a different spirituality, which involves, interestingly, makes them often more open to some of the things we find in the Gospels because they believe that the supernatural um, exists and can happen. And, you know, so much of our world has become materialistic in, in its... Well, both in, you know, the desire to have things, but in a, in a worldview that only views the physical as being the real. Um, that's a really refreshing thing to talk to people who believe in the supernatural. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you talked about this a little bit. I'd like you to, to mention just a few stereotypes. Uh, what's amazing to me, it almost never fails, uh, and you come up close to October, and uh, the, the evangelical blog posts start coming and maybe a new book or we, we brush, you know, blow the dust off the uh, 
last year's books uh, by evangelicals, exposés about uh, paganism and the evils of Halloween and all this. What are some of the, the stereotypes that you consistently run into that Christians and evangelicals and others have about pagans? Yeah, yeah. So it's an interesting thing. So there's like two parts to that um, question that I have to deal with. The one part is the stereotypical view of pagans. And the second one is the stereotypical view of Halloween. Mm. <laughs> and, and both of those are desperately wrong um, and almost impossible to reverse. Although I'm finding that it's beginning to reverse in terms of paganism. People are thinking differently when they come to Salem now. Um, so typically we've been told that you know, at least the big stories are if somebody's a witch, they're worshiping Satan or somehow they've given their soul to Satan. And this story goes back centuries. Um, you can you can track it back to the Salem witch trials. You can track it back to the beginning of modernity. And that's an interesting thing. Most people think that um, people who aren't Christians who look at the behavior of Christianity towards somebody like witches will talk about how medieval it is. There was nothing medieval about the persecution of witches. It happened in early modernity, and it was a lot of the intelligentsia and the people at the top who were bringing the persecution. So um, medieval times may have been a lot, much more peaceful toward them <laughs> than, than the modern man was with the beginning of science. Um, but so there's this view of a satanic um, motivation, but in the god and goddess systems of paganism, Satanism doesn't even Satan doesn't exist. He's he's not a being to to be worshipped in most of those. There are some small subclassifications of paganism, um, like Luciferian witchcraft, um, but most Satanists don't really fit in the category of paganism. In fact, most of them fit into the category of atheism. Mm -hmm. Um, and those who would consider themselves to believe in a Satan, um, believe that the story was upside down, kind of like, you know, the victor always tells history. Right. So you know, Jehovah was the bad guy and Satan was really the good guy. And so we're going to serve him. You know, that's, that's, that's the approach of most literal Satanism, but most witches don't view Satanists as being part of their worldview. They'd say, oh no. That's more like Christianity because, you know, they believe they believe in Satan and Jehovah and, you know, maybe they've reversed it. But that's closer to Christianity. That's what the witch would say than it is to us. So for years, the witches have looked at Satanists as giving them a bad name. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and and then, of course, we've had the stories of, you know, sacrifices and your cat's going to disappear on Halloween and. Those things don't happen in the pagan circles from what I've seen. We don't have anything like that. If it's going to happen, you'd think it happened in Salem, right? Right, right. It's not going on in Salem. In fact, all the witches have black cats. <laughs> and they love their kitties a lot. And don't you mess with their cat. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so the, this uh, this picture is very wrong, and and there's something called the Witchcraft League for Public Awareness, and for years they had a table in Salem, and they would just answer people's questions, or they'd make little wands for you know for kids or whatever, and people would ask these questions to them, and one of the questions they often got was, uh, it, they'd hear things like, well, what do children taste like? <laughs> <laughs> In, in all the talk about human sacrifice that occurred particularly through the 80s, when there was a fear about um, satanic ritual abuse, which was a phrase that was made up by a psychologist from Canada who had a, um, um, a patient that he left his wife for and then later married. And he wrote the book, Michelle Remembers. Mm -hmm. And that book became a bestseller. Mm -hmm. And he term, coined the term satanic ritual abuse. And when they looked into the history of Michelle, who, um, you know, supposedly remembered these things that were hidden in her deep, dark memories and, you know, um, and later came up through 
sitting at the psychologist's couch, um, there was, they could track nothing in the history of all the stories that she made up. So much of that occurred in the 80s. And you, so we had these scary stories that the church believed, whether it was Mike Warnke, who um, had his, um, what, what was that book he wrote? Uh, um, the Satan Seller. Satan Seller, yeah. So, it, you know, and, and his story got looked at and proved wrong. And yet we took these things, followed them out. Some people were even advising police um officers on crimes nobody's ever found all the bodies of the so-called sacrificed people nobody's ever found the evidence of these things especially when it was talked about as being widespread mm -hmm. um so for me i looked at that and i said i've got to start from ground zero and treat the person who calls themselves a, a witch or a druid or a pagan as a regular person and just start as I would with any other person um, on the street to get to know them um, with an openness of my own heart and the same kind of lovingness I would treat anybody else with. If I enter with fear, that's evident to a person that I'm afraid of them, right? Mm -hmm. And that's no way to begin relationships and to you know, try and transform, uh, try and offer something transforming to the human heart. Um, if I'm fearful, I'm angry, I'm biased, they know it, game up, I might as well just leave. Um, there's nothing redemptive that's going to happen there. Yeah. So. Well, <clears throat> so you've got this, uh, you've done the work with pagans, you continue to do that, but you've branched out over the years and you're doing this festival work. Um, years ago, when I was in seminary, I wanted to do something different for my seminary focus in intercultural studies, and I chose Burning Man. And uh, people thought I was a little crazy, but uh, I you not were. only read about it. Yeah, I was. But I got <laughs> yeah. a chance to go and, and do that thing that anthropologists call, you know, participant observation, and uh, take my research notes and all that, and write my, my thesis. Um, you have made Burning Man and other festivals a regular part of your ministry, can you talk a little bit about your your festival work and maybe even some opportunities uh, that people can get plugged into what you're doing? Yeah, so um, it was about well, now it's uh, ten years ago um, when we branched out from what we were doing with our month long Halloween festival in Salem, which now has something like three hundred people that come every year mm -hmm. from around the United States and the UK. Um, to minister with us. Um, and so we went to Burning Man, and uh, the second year I was there, we built an art project. First year was figure out what this festival is about, what makes it tick, and how we can um, minister to people. So um, the second year we built an art project. It was called the Pillars of the Saints, and it was this interactive event where people would sit on top of a pillar and we told them, listen for the voice of the spirit and don't come down till you hear it. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, it was based off of the sixth century Syrian monk, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, Simon Stylites. And uh, it was an amazing experience because we didn't really mediate that we wanted to hear them to listen for God or Jesus. We just said, listen for the voice of the spirit. But what people experienced was amazing because we had them write these words all over the walls. So that was the beginning of our work in Burns. Um, so I've been to Burning Man a number of times, but now Burning Man has expanded around the world. So we're, we're at a regional burn in Houston, Texas next month called Unbroken Spring, and it's about 500 people. And there's a couple there who, uh, Paul and Joy Burwell, who they they live about six miles from where it happens. That's how we got involved with it. I was visiting them, and they said, "Oh, there's a burn. You should go." And I said, "Yes, we should." And I dragged them, and and now they're they're like ma and pa to the burner community in Houston. They've just done a fantastic job, and they're setting up a a camp where they serve coffee and and just and just listen to people. Um, so that'll happen next month. And there's another burn we'll do in the UK called uh, Burning Nest. And we've been at that about five, six years now. Um, and 
Then there are rainbow gatherings, which most people think of rainbow as attached to the LGBT Mm -hmm. um, community. But there's there's a rainbow gathering that's just nomads and hippies who meet um, for up to a month at a time. And it's a worldwide phenomenon. It's you can find it on every continent and you could live from rainbow gathering to rainbow gathering. Mm -hmm. And some people do. So, you know, we've we've been in rainbow gatherings. There's a philosophy festival in Wales, and there's a book festival. (laughs) Um, I I go to the Welsh National Eisteddfod, which is an all Welsh language event. Um, You know, so plug for there it is. Come (laughs) right. Um, Yeah. Um, (laughs) Well, that's Welsh for Welsh. Um, I I speak Welsh, um, and I, I spend time with the Welsh language community. There are music festivals. An interesting one, um, we're going to be helping tent at something that's called a fairy festival mm. in Cornwall. Um, and then there's destination locations like Glastonbury, England, which you know is famous for its, its kind of new age spirituality and the story of Joseph of Arimathea bringing the Holy Grail to be you know, and it's buried under the uh, the uh, uh, tor at the top of Glastonbury. You know, so it's a it's a really interesting place. As well, and Cornwall at the tip of Cornwall is another one of those destinations that uh, we're kind of looking at. And then just recently, Slab City, which is you know the famous uh, Americana Art Salvation Mountain, is right. there. And it's it's a community of people. You know, like I was saying earlier. Uh, Half a million dollar motor homes and, uh, you know, meth head tweakers and everything in between living together on a place that was once a former military base. Um, and it, it was, it was a great, we had a little crew of people. We kind of traveled around together from one event to another because we met at something called the rubber tramp rendezvous. Um, <laughs> so, so, um, these are the kind of places that, uh, we're working and sometimes we're cooking food for people. Um, you know, one team in, in the UK does, uh, uh, omelets in the morning for people. And, and now they've kind of taken on a position of, uh, some leadership in that festival at mm-hmm. one of the burns. Mm-hmm. And, um, sometimes we're building art and sometimes we're just, you know, setting up uh, ministry encounter tents where we, um, in a sense, we're doing spiritual counseling with people. And everywhere we go, it, people stand in line for, for what's going on, which is such a flip on what I'd seen over many years. You know, and, and, and it's because these are places where people are coming to seek. So, um, so, yeah, right now in middle of March, we've got Unbroken Spring in Houston, and there's a, a team we have there. Um, and I'm hoping this year I want to up our game in Salem. I want to do what I'm calling Go Gorilla. I'd like to have hundreds of people dressed as angels walking around Salem praying. Because there's people who just like to pray for places like mm-hmm. that, right? Not Who not, aren't necessarily compelled to or feel comfortable engaging, but they love to pray. And I just want them walking around dressed as angels praying. That would, that would blow people's minds. And I want... I want a couple hundred people dressed as monks walking around offering free blessings. We've done that in the past. And mm. people will stop you and say, I want a blessing, you know, or, or free confessions. We've done that. And it's been amazing because we do reverse confessions where we confess the sins of the church. Right. And, and then people, they break down crying when they hear that because so many people already have accusations against Christianity, right? Um, and, uh, and then there's a number of things in the UK. Um, so there, there's, uh, there's a website that salemgathering.com. I have a list of the places that we're at and it, it's actually changing so much that I, I have to update it right now because there's new things that have just occurred. Um, and I'm, I'm in the UK from May through August. And then I'm traveling around the U.S. Um, from about November, uh, December on through May. So, you know, I'm right now I'm getting ready to go to Texas. Yes, you Texas, are. Right. Yeah. And, I'll, and <laughs> so I'll be at Houston and then I'll meet you in Austin. That's right. And we're actually going to do a little outreach in Austin. Um, okay. You know, 
some teams of people because South by Southwest is happening in Austin. So I'll be there for part of that. Um, yeah. Awesome. Uh, and yeah, you can uh, always use additional support, not only with people getting involved, but financial support. Uh, tell, tell folks how right. they can your Patreon page. Yeah. So uh, Patreon, <laughs> P-A-T-R-E-O-N, um, which is a name basically is for looking for patrons. And so I, I do a podcast and and i put out my writing um and a lot of this stuff goes specifically to the patrons but it's patreon.com slash phil wyman my name so w-y-m-a-n phil wyman awesome. yeah. we will include all of this in the uh the text uh that describes the podcast so folks cool. can click on it there and uh listen to you talk about it the podcast and we could go on forever but we like to make these podcasts accessible for busy people and kind of get yeah. uh, feel for what you're doing and then click on your website and other information to, to learn a whole lot more. So it's been my, I, I, I'm going to be nice to you for once. I'm usually not <laughs> one of our team meetings, but it's been my pleasure to, uh, to, to minister with you and uh, to count you as a friend and uh, you're a wild and crazy guy and you bless me. And uh, Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Likewise. I sure appreciate you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I encourage you to, to click on everything we're going to have associated with this podcast and, and learn more about what Phil's doing, get involved and uh, support it financially. We can't uh, recommend it more. Phil, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thanks, John, and see you soon. <laughs>